Okay, well, as you're well aware, uh, well, I think hopefully you're aware there's a lot going on in the world where uh, dictators are arising everywhere and they're using their police and their army to support their, um, well, their dictatorship. And the police are now turning very brutal and they're harming people. And this is quite evident here in Australia, not just in Victoria, but elsewhere. And so I felt that uh, tonight's message needed to um, look at what, how Christians need to respond to some of the provocations or, or whatever it might be needed. People might ask, Should, uh, are you going to come along to a protest? And so we need to look at these things tonight. Now, here in, in Melbourne, um, you see this image here. We have what's been termed uh, policemen now dressed up as a robocop, meaning a robotic policeman. Um, he's got a capsicum spray on him down the back behind his hand. He's got a baton. Uh, he's got a, a .4 uh, caliber a Smith & Western gun. Uh, he's got lightweight body armour on his knees and he's got it on his arms. Um, he's also got um, an integrated equipment vest with radios and all sorts of things and, of course, his protective helmet. So it makes him quite a formidable enemy if uh, he comes up and pushes someone around in a crowd. And especially they won't come up singularly. There'll be three, four or five of them and they'll just jump on one man and take take that man or even a woman down to the ground very quickly. So this is really what we're uh, we're looking at today, and um, we'll see how we go. We we are living in a very dangerous world today. The world has always been a violent place in which to live, but in the past there was some form of order in which justice could sometimes be pursued especially in democratic countries like the United States of America, Canada, the UK, Australia and New Zealand. However, since COVID-19 changed the world earlier this year, it seems that in countries where democracy was well established and often taken for granted, its citizens are now being governed by authoritarian leaders who have little regard for their country's constitution or for human rights, especially where the people want to express free speech. So there's uh, a scripture there that uh, confirms this. It says that when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Amen. So this, is, this sort of parallels a scripture verse that says, that we are to pray for those who have the rule over us in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 I think it is, or 2, 1. Anyway, so, so you know, if, if Christians want a good ruler, we are to pray for them. If we fail to do that, we end up getting wicked rulers. So below is an image of what people are faced with today if they choose to protest about the policies of a tyrannical leader. Now, um, I've placed here a face mask of a devil over a policeman's face because this is a, um, an image that was taken in Sydney and these are two policemen who have, well, he, this man here's a protester, protesting for free speech in Sydney and he was beaten very badly by police. And there's no reason for this. This is just free speech. And... Um, so, so uh, this, is, this is what I'm saying, that these people are no longer uh, keeping the peace. These people are almost a private army for tyrannical leaders. So yeah. the purpose of this study tonight is to focus on what has been brought about or what has brought about the situation that has allowed lawless leaders to obtain illegal power that encourages lawlessness among the police, uh, which brings harm to innocent people just trying to defend their rights. 
And this is simply for the police men and women, or is it really for, simply for the police men and women to earn a significant paycheck? Because these people get paid a lot more money when they're out on the front line in, in, in confrontation. Or is it having unfettered power to wage terror over their victims? Meaning that this is being a demonic kind of power. And this is why I put this face mask on this man. Yes. Secondly, there have been calls for people to protest throughout the world and to potentially become involved in confrontation with the police. So the question in this study is, what should Christians do in such situations? So both of these issues will be looked at in this study. Yes. So the cause, uh, we're going to look at the cause of society's breakdown. We've got to go back to the basics here. So it is my belief that the reason why Victoria, Australia and the remainder of the world is in this pandemic is because the broader church throughout the world no longer serves Jesus Christ, but it is serving its own self-interests instead, which means that they have listened to Satan's lies that they no longer need to serve Jesus Christ. So... Uh, Satan's good at telling lies, but so are his ministers. So in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, it says, and no marvel. Now, this is uh, just an old King James uh, statement, but it says, don't be surprised. Be very aware. Don't feel astonished in any way. This, what I'm saying to you, is real. That's what those three words mean. And then... Um, the Apostle Paul saying, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, meaning that Satan masquerades as one of God's angels. And even the, he's, he's so good at it, even uh, the godly angels in heaven don't recognise him. They, they can't recognise Satan when he appears amongst them. Only God can. Jesus Christ can. But, but he, he's so sneaky, he appears as one of God's angels. So therefore, so it's saying, that, therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, that's here on the earth, and I'm saying that stand in the pulpits today, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, meaning they appear to be Christ's ministers. But then Paul says, who's in, meaning they'll end up in hell, shall be according to their works. So this is what it means. Everybody's works are going to define who they are and where they end up in eternity. But this is really um, highlighting that we've got to be very aware of Satan and his angels because they're here to deceive us. And this is what they've successfully done in the pulpits today. Uh, um, here in this uh, second scripture verse, Mark 16, verse 15, this is the command that Jesus gave to all of his disciples. And he, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So that is a command that all Christians have to obey. There's no Christian who, uh, who is following Jesus can't in some form or another preach the gospel towards every creature. However... On the contrary, Satan always says, Yea, hath God said, meaning you need to preach the gospel to every creature throughout the world. And so a lot of pastors and the Christians in the church are saying, Oh, yeah, well, let's see, um, you know, fund some um, evangelists and we'll send them over to wherever, some dark place in Africa, and we'll let them do it. But God has said, You go into all the world. Now, the world just means outside your door. doesn't mean you have to get on a boat. But Satan has always said, yea, hath God said. So these are the things that I believe, these two scripture verses here, uh, reflect the apostasy that is in the modern church today. Amen? Okay. So it is notable that church leaders in Victoria, that's here where I am, continue to remain silent about everything offensive to God in our society, such as abortion, ab 
abortions are really bad here in Victoria, both early and late term abortions. Of course, there's a drug epidemic that's been rampant everywhere for decades around the world. Uh, in recent years, there's been the sexualization of children through government programs into the um, homosexual and LGBTQI community. One, I presume you all are familiar with that uh, terminology, and especially against br police brutality. In other words, the pastors in the churches are silent about all of these major social issues in our society. Now, this pathetic behaviour of preferring to be compliant with government requirements to shut their doors and hold their services online during this uh, COVID so-called pandemic is not according to God's word. So uh, in Acts 5 verse 29, Peter and the apostles answered and said these are to the uh, leaders of the Jews in those days, the Sanhedrin Council, it said that we ought to obey God rather than men because they were told not to preach in the name of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. And they said, no, we're going to continue to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, and we're not going to obey the word of men. So they actually got beaten and then they were released, but they went out rejoicing, you know, that they'd, been, they'd suffered persecution for the name of Christ. So this is really what it's all about here. Um, uh, you know, suffering for the name of Jesus, yet the pastors in the churches, they don't want any of that at all. So most of today's ministers pr prefer to comply with government requirements rather than obeys, obey Christ's commands. Now, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And, and even going back to uh, King Solomon, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. First of all, you've got to fear God. And so I have to say a lot of pastors today do not fear God. And the second thing, commandment is to keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. These are, this is an everlasting requirement. It's got nothing to do with Old Testament versus New Testament. This is what God wants everyone who calls upon him in faith. To fear God, uh, fear not them who are able to uh, kill the body, but rather fear him who was able to cast both body and soul into hell. So that is um, fearing God, and we must keep his commandments, especially if we say we love Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that's what that one's all about. And then in 2 Timothy 4, it says, For the time will come when they meaning today's Christians in the churches, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves what I say are false teachers, and then they have itching ears to hear more of their lies because they're telling them things that they want to hear, and because of that they shall turn away their ears from the truth that's contained in the scriptures, and the truth well, in the scriptures, it will be turned into fables, meaning fairy stories, meaning that people won't, won't believe them, okay? So those are the core scriptures that I feel focus on tonight's uh, study. Um, in comparison to these commands, scripture indicates that both Noah and Lot were the only righteous men living on the earth in their days. These men were worthy to escape God's wrath while the remaining inhabitants perished. So Matthew 24, 37 says, But as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be in these days. Right? And in Luke 17, 30, it says, Likewise also was it in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold. They planted, they builded, but the same day the lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. 
So we're living in the days of Noah and we're living in the days of Lot. And obviously this means that the world is now violent and apostate and uh, God has really no representatives on the earth except a handfuls of his faithful believers spread around the world. So similarly, if today's clergy are more focused on being compliant to government directives that are clearly cruel, repressive and authoritarian in nature, rather than complying with and doing God's will in faith, who then are they serving? So I'm saying that they're not serving Jesus Christ. They're serving today's authoritarian rulers by being compliant, okay? So I looked around the internet and I found this illustration, which although it deals probably more with a private company and quite often the company's got to be compliant with a lot of things um, internally and externally, such as policies, requirements, standards, the law, regulation and rules, I thought that it was probably illustrative of what governments are issuing today to everyone, um, but it also applies to the church because in here one of the requirements would be that, um, you know, people are not allowed to gather uh, in buildings such as churches and, um, you know, if they do, then there's rules associated with all that. So this is really what man devises to control a situation so that by compliance um, they get an outcome that they want. However, on the other side of the ledger, Acts 5.29 says we ought to obey God rather than men, which is what we just read before with Peter. So um, this is this is where the um, seesaw tips one way or the other for uh, the pastors in the churches today. They've got the the choice of whether they're going to comply with government mandates or are they going to comply with God and what He wants. So in uh, Psalm seventy five verse seven, in that sense it says, "But God is the judge." He putteth down one ruler and he setteth up another ruler. Now, he can put up, uh, he can put down one pastor and he can set up another pastor. Um, this, this means he can put down one in authority and set up another in authority. So God is the one who chooses who's going to um, move into that new or vacant position, okay, if he's going to rule that person's going to rule over God's people. So whether you've got um, the Christians or the Jews on the earth, you've also got God's people who are neither one or the other, and God has the final say who's going to rule. Amen. I'll just go through these two here. So Romans 13, 1 says, But let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. This is, means the rulers in civil society. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. All right, so this is where we do, God requires us, if you've got godly rulers, that we have to be subject unto them and not disobey them. Okay? And then it says here in Matthew 12, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. So what I'm trying to say here is that where we've got Acts 5.29 up here, we, we ought to obey God rather than men. And if God wants us to go out and preach the gospel to every creature, and even if we suffer persecution for it, well, Jesus says, well, you are my brother or my sister or my mother. So you are my family in heaven, members of my family in heaven. So that's a wonderful promise if we do the will of our Father in heaven. Amen. These are the promises. So if we're, we've been given the promises, we've got to work towards them to make sure that they they will be fulfilled in our life. Now, 
moving on here, it says, it is my belief that the Antichrist and his authoritarian regime throughout the earth can only come into power when God's people are no longer faithfully serving God and his son Jesus Christ. In this, God gives people, the rulers, that reflect the level of perfection in God's people or the level of corruption he has detected in his people. Okay, this is the this is the balance. God looks at, you know, whether his people are perfecting or perfected or whether they're continuing to be corrupted by their pastors and the people that they associate with as Christians. Now, this is the very important uh, aspect of it all. This is what I believe. Now, as an example of God's people rejecting God in Old Testament times, the Israelites demanded that uh, Samuel, the priest, appoint a king to rule over them in the same manner in which pagan kings ruled over their people. So in 1 Samuel 8 verse 7, this is what the, uh, the Lord said to Samuel when Samuel was very concerned that the Israelite people as a nation were demanding that uh, the priesthood no longer reign over them, but they wanted a king to reign over them like the pagans. So, and the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken, meaning listen and understand unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, in and I'm saying in demanding a king, for they have not rejected thee, that's the priesthood, but they have rejected me, who is above the priesthood, that I should not reign over them through the Levitical priesthood. That's really what all of that's saying. So I'm saying that um, this is the um, apostasy that began back in um, Samuel's day of uh, the Israelites. And really this is what Satan has done to the modern church today. Um, they've gone astray from God. So in this claim, the Old Testament provides examples of God's people committing offensive behaviour towards him as illustrated in the list of godly and ungodly kings of Israel and Judah as shown in the table below. Now, just as an illustration in Judges, um, it, says, uh, it says there, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim, that's different uh, false gods, and Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all of his days. Now you can see these common two statements are uh, 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 everywhere in the Old Testament in relation to the kings. They either did evil or they did what was right. And so we don't need to go too deeply into this, but there were 33 kings in Israel who did evil, and that was in Judah as well. So we don't need to look too closely, but you can see Saul did evil. That's King Saul. And Solomon, he did evil in the end. He started off good, but he ended up going into idolatry and all sorts of things. And we go down here and we can see a lot of them, all of these 33 here. But then over here, we've got nine kings in Israel who did right. And they're listed here. And it says in the note that not one king of the northern kingdom of Israel was godly. All of the godly kings were from the kingdom of Judah. Okay. So I just wanted to show you, I just wanted to show you that all these kings here, they had the priesthood. And what happened was that the priesthood corrupted themselves. And when the priesthood corrupted themselves, then the kings corrupted themselves. And when that happened, then the people were corrupted and then they went into idolatry. And the kings you often used to lead them that way. So yes. this, is, this is the problem throughout the, all of the Bible where corruption has crept into God's people over millennia, you know, thousands of years. So the long history of offensive behaviour of God's people became so bad in Israel 
at the time of Zedekiah that God had to end the reign of the kings by bringing King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon against Jerusalem to set aside the royal line of kings from sitting upon the throne of David. So this fulfilled the prophecy of Hosea some 150 years previous to this, where he said that there would be a long time that Israel and Judah would be without kings on their thrones, and this was because of God's judgment. So in Hosea 3, verse 4, it says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king and without a prince. Now, that prince meaning that the kings would marry and produce children and the firstborn would be the one who would inherit the throne when his father died. And then it says, and without an animal sacrifices, so that means that they'd There'd be no temple in Jerusalem where they could, um, uh, you know, kill the animal sacrifices. And they would be without an image of a false god because they're very prone to having images of false gods. And they would be without an ephod, meaning the Urim and the Thummim, meaning the priesthood. So all the priesthood would disappear. And they would be without teraphim, meaning idol gods, right? These were, these were statues. So this was um, um, prophesied by Hosea 150 years before King Zedekiah had to uh, capitulate his throne to the king of Babylon. And that ended the royal line of kings reigning in Jerusalem. Now, the kings still had children in captivity. They still produced sons. And that lineage continued on unto Mary and Joseph. And Joseph was the legal right to the throne, but he was a carpenter because he, he had to live like everybody else. He had no royal title. He only had a lineage all the way back to David through Solomon. So... Um, this is the way it was because God had had enough of the kings um, leading his people astray. Amen. So from the time of the end of the reign of King Zedekiah until Christ was born, Israel had not been ruled by one of their kings. Therefore, Israel and Judah were without a king for some 560 years before Christ was born. That's a very long time. Yes. Now, the above illustration represents the same level of apostasy that the Bible describes about Israel and her kings that has happened within the modern churches today. This is because every society throughout the world since the days of Adam and Eve has had to endure the same serpent in the Garden of Eden, deceiving and corrupting them by him, saying, Yea, hath God said. This is my point here. We're still dealing with a very active serpent, that great serpent, the devil, and too many people are succumbing to his lies. Therefore, it is not surprising that most Christians succumb to his temptations and lies, just as the kings of Israel and Judah succumb to his lies as recorded in scripture of their idolatrous and wicked practices. Now, in comparison to this, many Christians today are taught in their churches to seek prosperity, and I'm saying that's the sin of covetousness, or a new, say a new marriage, which is the sin of adultery, or to a tolerate gay marriage, which is the sin of homosexuality. Pedophilia and child pornography are also evident in the churches and among ministry leaders. For Christians who don't succumb to any of these, quote, works of the flesh that are mentioned in Galatians 5, Satan has them believe one of the many false gospels that cannot save, such as once saved, always saved, or eternal security. So from the spiritual perspective, the Christian leaders of today have compromised the words in the Bible and truth so much 
that Jesus is no longer able to use them in spreading the gospel message as in the Great Commission to go forth and preach the gospel uh, to all creatures. So in this, God says, and this is from Psalm 50, uh, but unto the wicked, meaning the Jews and the Christians today, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant, and I'm saying the covenant of salvation, in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee. This is very common today. I've had years of approaching pastors and ministry leaders, not only in Australia but around the world, sharing the, Paul's gospel of initial and final salvation, and I don't get a response from them. I think over about 80 emails that I've sent, I've had one or two people comment, but never anyone who's in full agreement with it. So this is what God is saying. He's classing these people as wicked, okay? And yeah, that's, what he would have, that's what he would have said to the um, Israelites or, or those in Judah. Um, if they'd gone into uh, idolatry, he would have called them wicked. Now, in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when they, so that we're talking about the Christians in the end times today, they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves false teachers having itching ears to hear more of their lies and they shall turn away their ears from the truth that's plainly written in scripture and scripture shall be turned into fables. Now we read all of that one before but this is really what it means that um, you know the modern church has gone exactly the same way as the uh, Israelites and the Jews in the Old Testament. Now in this falling away from God, the Apostle Paul prophesied that today's Christians would act as similar generations of God's people have failed God throughout millennia, where he said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, meaning the day of Antichrist, shall not come except there come a falling away, meaning of the Christian church, into apostasy first, and followed by um, observing the event that that man of sin, meaning Satan's son, be revealed, who is known as the son of perdition. So the first indicator of prior to Satan's son being revealed on the earth is the falling away of the Christian church. And I'm saying that that's what we're seeing very uh, vividly today. Amen. Yes. So the above verse in 2 Thessalonians 2 has been fulfilled partially by today's Christians who have failed to obey the true gospel by their falling away from the faith into error. Now such error comes about from the many false gospels that do not require any obedience to be saved. And Romans 10 verse 16, the apostle Paul says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So the true gospel requires people to obey it. And part of that is to go forth and preach the gospel to all creatures. Because if somebody preached the gospel to us, we're obligated to go forth and spread the word to others so they similarly might be saved. And I say that that's not happening and certainly not enough for um, the modern church to um, be saved. Now, the next heading here is how has the church failed Christ and God? So Amen. we'll have a look here. The video below shows evidence that the Russian communists or Satanists implemented an infiltration campaign into the worldwide church that commenced in 1907. Their aim was to corrupt it of its potential power to overcome Satan and his servants, thereby allowing fallen angels, demons and wicked men and women to have a free range over corrupting the world that God had established. So I'm saying that back in 1907, 
and earlier, and there was a revival in the church back in the 1800s. You'll find that a lot of the old hymns were written in the 1700s and the 1800s, and there was a lot of evangelism that took place in the uh, late 1800s and 1900s. And so the communists knew that if the church progressed throughout the world in spirit and in power, meaning they demonstrated the power of God, that communism would not have a hope of surviving into the future. So they decided that they would infiltrate the churches and the seminaries and what have you. Now, this video here, um, there's a link here that's shown here. Um, you need to watch it. It is on my blog and uh, it, it only runs for about 10 minutes, but it's very informative and provides the ample evidence to show who, um, who the people were who infiltrated the church in those early days. So the final goal was to make Christ's churches so powerless that the communists would eventually bring them into bondage, meaning slavery. That's what bondage means. So in 2 Peter 2, verse 19, it says, while they, and this is talking about the false preachers in the false churches, uh, promised them, that's the Christians in these churches, liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, the same is he brought into bondage. So this is really what is going to happen in a very practical terms to modern Christians is that they'll end up in bondage and slavery to the Antichrist. So in, in this, the, the above video reveals modern preachers have brought in damnable heresies that are referred to in 2 Peter 2 and abominable practices as witnessed by the ordination of homosexual clergy in the churches. Now, given that many churches are never critical of government policies in the public sphere, and this is by their acquiescence, meaning their the reluctant acceptance of something without protest, their silence has allowed the higher powers, meaning the politicians, to become corrupt. Now, this state of affairs means modern churches are more concerned about obeying government directives rather than obeying God and Christ's commands to go outside their church and, and preach the gospel. So we've had a look at this before, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, if God's people have failed to obey this command, this indicates that we're near the end, then shall the end come. Um, we're very close to it. So similarly, Christians who have believed the devil's lie that they need medical doctors more than they need the power of the Holy Spirit to heal them in all of their sicknesses and diseases, this also is another indication of the falling away of the Christian church into apostasy. So in Second Chronicles 16, it says, And King Asa, in the third, 39th year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. So this is an indicator of falling away. Yes. Um, I might say more about this later. Now, therefore, the churches throughout the Western world today have no spiritual power to overcome Satan and the illnesses that he can bring upon them because they have failed to study to understand the scriptures. And that's what it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who was rightly able to divide the word of truth in that scripture. Now, this is exactly the situation that Satan and the communists have been working towards for a long time so that they can bring about their new world order, which can only happen with a spiritually powerless Christian church. So this is what was started over a century ago by leavening the church, and now we've arrived 
at that point. Amen? So, the question now is what to do when the enemy comes knocking on your door? So this is, um, this is a, a big question. Now, one of our greatest concerns in this life is the possibility that one greater and mightier than ourselves will either meet us in the street or come knocking on our door to make demands on us that may put one's welfare or life in harm's way. So we've got to remember that in the days of David and Goliath, Goliath was a huge giant. Uh, Goliath was probably around 20 feet tall. So he would have been at least three times the height of David. So you can see an image here of David, and he's only up to this man's knees. That's how small. And even, um, you know, um, he was like a grasshopper, if you can imagine that, compared to Goliath. However, today, the modern, the modern Goliaths now are the police force that we can see here on the right with their riot gear and their batons and their helmets and all this sort of stuff. So either way, we can be confronted with terror, just like David. But David had been trained by God ready for this day of confrontation with Goliath. And it's my belief that with uh, you people here, that God wants to train us not to so much be in confrontation with these people here, but in case any of them want to come knocking on our door when it's their choosing, not our choosing. So in David's day as a shepherd boy, he challenged Goliath to a contest while using the skills God had taught him while caring for his sheep. Now David applied those skills towards killing Israel's worst enemy, this Philistine giant. Now, in 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 36, it says, And David said to King Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard. That means he caught a lion by the beard and smote him and slew him. Amen. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Amen. Amen. So this is what I mean. You see... God puts his people into training so that when the enemy comes, like Goliath, they know how to respond. Now here, where you've got a slingshot with a stone that's in the sling, this stone had to be slung by David, and once it left the sling, God put his power behind that stone so that when it smashed into the head of Goliath, it went through like a bullet and went penetrated right into that skull. And uh, David may not have been able to do it in his own strength, but it was Dave, David plus God who killed Goliath. And David's faith. Yes. Yeah, and it was all his faith and his skills as well. Mm. So this is what I mean, and this is what I'm leading to at the moment. Amen? So... In comparison to mankind's worst enemy today, it is becoming clear that the police forces of the world have been supplied with equipment representing that of soldiers on a battlefield opposing a foreign army rather than its own citizens who simply want to protest peaceably about a tyrannical leader. So what does one do? Firstly, Every Christian must have developed a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, their Saviour, in much the same manner as the prophet Zacharias prophesied over Jesus Christ at his circumcision, as stated below. So here there's a few verses of scripture to read, but they are important. 
Now, and it says, and his, meaning John the Baptist's father, named Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us to be being rather delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life amen, amen. so these these uh, words that i've written in red are the key um scripture verses that we need to embrace because there are promises in there and there are also requirements, which is holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And that is what the modern churches have failed to accept and to um, embrace and, and implement. Okay, yeah. so um, if we, if we um, um, live in a state of holiness and righteousness before God, God says that we will be saved from our enemies and all of the all of the hand of them that hate us. It says, although it could be assumed that the above words relate to the people of Israel, they do apply to every Christian who is able to meet the same requirements. Now, to confirm that the promises above apply to Christians today, the verses below state that Christians who remain faithful to go towards God as Abraham was faithful, also inherit the promises made by God to Abraham. But this is what we're going to look at now. Um, so it says in Galatians 3, verses 6 to 9, it says, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same, the same people of faithfulness demonstrated in Christians, are the children of Abraham. That's a very significant uh, verse of scripture. Okay, Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees. He was unknown to God. But God looked on him and he saw that he was a very righteous man in a generation that was unrighteous. And so God revealed himself to Abraham and said, come and follow me, leave all your family. And he went and he offered up his son and he did lots of good things. And uh, in the scripture, it says that Abraham was a friend of God. Right? Abraham was a friend of God. Now, what a wonderful title to be named as, you know, as a friend of God. So, you know, Abraham inherited all the promises that it, the seed of, uh, you know, of his descendants would be numbered as the stars of the sky and of the, the sand and the seashore. And um, so what it's saying here is it's saying, well, you know, God wasn't going to let Abraham fall into the hands of his enemies for some silly reason. He was going to protect Abraham. And so here, these scriptures here, that particularly this verse says here, we have those same promises if we live in the same pattern as Abraham did. Yes. So verse 8 says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, that the Gentiles, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So this isn't just the um, Jewish nation. This is all nations. This is the Gentile nations, right? So in thee shall all nations be best, blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Yeah. So 
the, these three verses here are wonderful verses that give us the power that um, God is offering each and every one of us to overcome our enemies. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, therefore... It is very clear to me that if a heathen policeman approaches a spirit-filled Christian, that such a person, that's the heathen policeman, should see Christ in you, the hope of glory, and depart in peace. Now, that's what I would say would be a desired outcome. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Amen? Amen. Right? Amen. So this is what I would say if a policeman does approach you or somebody who is potentially a threat, they should see Christ in you, the hope of glory. Right. Now, if that, if that doesn't happen, this is what happened to those who approached Christ to subdue him in the Garden of Gethsemane prior to his crucifixion. So in John 18, it says... Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, meaning the high priest officers who confronted him in the garden, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now, here is an illustration that I found on the internet today, and you can see that Jesus is in the middle here, and he's just finished saying, I am he. And here they are, they're all falling back on one another. Here's a man, he's on, these two men here almost thrown down, you know, a metre or two away from Jesus Christ. And this man here is running away. Um, this was the power of God demonstrating that Jesus could have called a legion of angels to have defended him if he'd wanted to. It says that in the scriptures. But he didn't want to. He wanted them to take him away to be crucified. But the thing is that he was demonstrating that he had the power to do whatever he wanted. And it was, wasn't just to demonstrate to those who were coming after him. It was for his disciples to demonstrate to them that they could have that same power too if they needed it. So the scene depicted above is what I believe Christians should see happening in our day if we are confronted by evil men wanting to harm us, our family or others unable to defend themselves. So 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verses 25 and 6 say, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world, meaning Christians who preach the gospel, to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. Amen. So this is this is the, the corrupt politicians who believe that they have more might and power than anyone else. However, God has chosen what would be considered the weak things of this world, which are the Christians, and he's chosen us in faith to confound the things that are mighty. Amen. Amen. And I'll just read on here. Now, this has got a few verses, about nine verses here, but it's worth reading. So this is out of Hebrews 11, which is the faith chapter in the Bible. It says, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to, to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah and of David also and of Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms they wrought righteousness, they obtained the promises, they stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the violence of fire. So that would have been Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness they were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. That would have been Samson. 
turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. That's something to wor worth dwelling upon, isn't it? Who would love a better resurrection? I just think that that better resurrection means the first resurrection. I don't think there's anything better than the first resurrection because uh, a resurrection could be the second resurrection and we don't want to be in the second resurrection. Anyway, moving on, it says, and others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they tempted. Sawn asunder means they were cut in two with a saw or a, or a, um, a sword. They were tempted, they were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted and tormented. And now we're getting to the real stuff. It says, of whom the world was not worthy. This is the people in the world who are non-Christians today. They wandered in the deserts and in the mountains and in the dens and the caves of the earth. So they're obviously outcasts from society. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. So these are the Old Testament saints, okay? I've got so these re, uh, obtained a, a good report through faith and, and received not the promise of God's protection, but God having provided some better thing for us, and I'm saying meaning His protection, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now, so people under the law could never be made perfect. However. God and Christ require all of his saints to be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So he can, we can only become perfect if we can do the uh, works that Christ did and even greater works than he did to show that we are truly the sons of God. Amen? So I'll just, I'll just move on here. It says uh, in Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do unto me. Okay? He, can only, he can only kill the body, but he can't kill the soul. Amen. Yes. But, you know, I do believe that God has provided a better thing for us, meaning his protection. You know, there's nothing... There's nothing for God to uh, be gained by our death, not today. If this was 2,000 years ago, God could be gained something by our death because the Bible, uh, Jesus said, unless a seed fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die and brings forth fruit, then um, I can't remember what it says after that. But, you know, that's the purpose of Christianity dying in the faith to, to uh, bring, bring forth more, more seed and more fruit. Um, so in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power Amen. and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. All these three things are absolutely essential in the days that we're living in. And this is what I believe that the modern Christian church is lacking. They don't have power, which is the gifts of the Spirit and all of those fine gifts. They don't have love. They have what's called conditional love, meaning if you go into them and you believe what they believe, they're happy to welcome you in every Sunday. But that's as far as it goes. And the question is whether, you know, they have a sound mind as well. Uh, anyway, yeah. we'll leave that as it is. And then in Revelation 21.8, it says, but the fearful and the unbelieving Christians, I've got Christians there, there are a lot of unbelieving Christians, they only believe certain portions of the Bible that they're comfortable with. So all of these shall have their part in the lake of fire, the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So anybody in the church who is fearful and if they're unbelieving, that's where they're going to end up. Amen. That's what God says, not me. Amen. 
So I think we're getting near the end here. So in the meantime, this is in the meantime between now and when the rapture happens. I'm saying to be able to implement God's protection for his children against those who might try to harm them, he requires each of them to first meet his requirements for initial salvation and final salvation that undertake that requires the undertaking of works of faith. And James says faith without works is dead, using the gifts of the Spirit so as to produce fruit that uh, God requires as the gardener inspecting the branches grafted into Jesus and to become an active member in the body of Christ, each of which has been fitly joined together in love. Now, this is in this scripture verse, um, Ephesians 4 verse 16. It says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This is one of the most critical aspects of the Christian life is to not only love your neighbour as yourself, you've got to love the brethren. And, uh, you know, it says, uh, no, what does it say something about no? Uh, no, a man to do no more than to lay his his life down for for his brethren, and that's really what love um, typifies is um, that that level of love. So um, in John John thirteen it says uh, Jesus says a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So I'm trying to stress here the, the significance and the importance that loving one another in the church is so vital because it's very difficult sometimes to love one another. <laughs> very difficult. But we have to do it. And we've got to start changing changing our mindset if we can't achieve it. So it's like um, a, a wife having an obstinate husband. She's got to somehow change him and she may have to change herself a bit too. But either way, the change has got to take place for, you know, everything to happen the way it should. <laughs> Yeah, so so love is very important, okay? Without love, we are not the children of God. Yes. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse uh, 25 to 27, it says that there should be no schism. Now, that means that no divisions between anyone in the church Amen. that represents in the body of Christ, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And where the one member suffer, meaning if someone's found some hard times, it's saying all the members should suffer along with it, meaning bear one another's burdens. Or if one member be honoured, meaning, you know, something good has happened to them, then all the other members should rejoice with it. And then the last verse says, now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Now, here we are with the favourite illustrations to show that, you know, as we are members of the body of Christ on the right here with the eye ministry and nose ministry and all these ministries representing the body of Christ, we've all got to be growing in faith and growing in grace and doing all the works. All of these things are vital as individuals. So this is really the, I put this up here to show what individuals should be attaining to in their uh, Christian life. But collectively, we are all supposed to be members of the body of Christ on the right. And this is all these, um, all these members are supposed to love one another as just as I've read out from the above scriptures. So it's no good doing the left-hand side and leaving the right-hand side out of it. 
we have to do both sides, the individual side here of finishing uh, the race that's set before us and do and, and joining in as the body of Christ as members. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, so if Christians today can meet the above terms as required by Christ to properly represent him on earth as being one of his ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven, he will never allow one of his ambassadors to be overcome by the evil one or his representatives. So in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's the key statement in that verse, okay? Yes. And in Luke, Luke 10, 19, it says, Behold, I, meaning Jesus Christ, give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen? Yes. And, then, and then in 1 Peter 4, verse 19, it's saying, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Amen. So, yeah. so if, we, if we suffer anything according to the will of God, God is going to see us right one way or another. Okay? That's really what that means. Amen? So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's the end of the presentation for tonight. If anybody has any questions they might like to ask, I'll see what I can do to answer them. Praise the Lord.